if more gently than Orpheus. Chapter 2 Loss of Direction If more gently than Orpheus, who moved even the trees, you were to pluck the zither, the lifeblood would not return to the vain shadow. Harsh fate, but its burden becomes lighter to bear since everything that attempts to turn back is impossible. Book 1, Ode 24 Where does the eternal current come from? Clocks may well run at different speeds in the mountains and in the plains, but is this really what concerns us, ultimately, about time? In a river the water flows more slowly near its banks, faster in the middle, but it is still flowing. Is time not also something that always flows from the past to the future? Let's leave aside the precise measurement of how much time passes that we wrestled with in the preceding chapter, the numbers by which time is measured. There's another, more essential aspect to time. Its passage, its flow, the eternal current of the first of Rilke's Duino elegies. The eternal current draws all the ages along with it through both realms, overwhelming them in both. Past and future are different from each other. Cause precedes effect. Pain comes after a wound, not before it. The glass shatters into a thousand pieces, and the pieces do not reform into a glass. We cannot change the past. We can have regrets, remorse, memories. The future, instead, is uncertainty, desire, anxiety, open space, destiny, perhaps. We can live towards it, shape it, because it does not yet exist. Everything is still possible. Time is not a line with two equal directions. It is an arrow with different extremities. And it's this, rather than the speed of its passing, that matters most to us about time. This is the fundamental thing about time. The secret of time lies in this slippage that we feel on our pulse, viscerally, in the enigma of memory, in anxiety about the future. This is what it means to think about time. What exactly is this flowing? Where is it nestled in the grammar of the world? What distinguishes the past, its having been, from the future, its not having been yet, in the folds of the mechanism of the world? Why to us is the past so different from the future? 19th and 20th century physics engaged with these questions and ran into something unexpected and disconcerting, much more so than the relatively marginal fact that time passes at different speeds in different places. The difference between past and future, between cause and effect, between memory and hope, between regret and intention, in the elementary laws that describe the mechanisms of the world, there is no such difference. Heat It all began with a regicide. On the 16th of June, 1793, the National Convention in Paris sentenced Louis XVI to death. Rebellion is perhaps among the deepest roots of science, the refusal to accept the present order of things. Among those who took the fatal decision was a friend of Robespierre called Lazare Carnot, Carnot had a passion for the great Persian poet Sadi Shirazi. Captured and enslaved at Acre during the Crusades, Shirazi is the author of those luminous verses that now stand at the entrance of the headquarters of the United Nations. All of the sons of Adam are part of one single body. They are of the same essence. When time afflicts us with pain, in one part of that body... All the other parts feel it too. If you fail to feel the pain of others, you do not deserve the name of man. Perhaps poetry is another of science's deepest roots, the capacity to see beyond the visible. Kano names his first son after Sadi. Sadi Kano is thus born out of poetry and rebellion. As a young man, he develops a passion for these steam engines that at the start of the 19th century are beginning to transform the world by using fire to make things turn. 
1824, he writes a pamphlet with the alluring title Reflections on the Motive Power of Fire, in which he seeks to understand the theoretical basis of the functioning of these machines. The little treatise is packed with mistaken assumptions. He imagines that heat is a concrete entity, a kind of fluid that produces energy by falling from hot things to cold, just as the water in a waterfall produces energy by falling from above to below. But it contains a key idea that steam engines function in the final analysis because the heat passes from hot to cold. Sadi's pamphlet finds its way into the hands of a fierce-eyed, austere Prussian professor called Rudolf Clausius. It is he who grasps the fundamental issue at stake, formulating a law that was destined to become famous. If nothing else around it changes, heat cannot pass from a cold body to a hot one. The crucial point here is the difference from what happens with falling bodies. A ball may fall, but it can also come back up by rebounding, for instance. Heat cannot. This is the only basic law of physics that distinguishes the past from the future. None of the others do so. Not Newton's laws governing the mechanics of the world, not the equations for electricity and magnetism formulated by Maxwell, not Einstein's on relativistic gravity, nor those of quantum mechanics devised by Heisenberg, Schrödinger and Dirac, not those for elementary particles formulated by 20th century physicists. Not one of these equations distinguishes the past from the future. If a sequence of events is allowed by these equations, so is the same sequence run backwards in time. In the elementary equations of the world, the arrow of time appears only where there is heat. Footnote. Strictly speaking, the arrow of time can also manifest itself in phenomena that are not linked directly to heat but share crucial aspects with it. For instance, in the use of retarded potentials in electrodynamics. What follows applies also for these phenomena, in particular the conclusions. I prefer here not to overload the discussion by breaking it down into all its different subcases. End of footnote. The link between time and heat is therefore fundamental. Every time a difference is manifested between the past and the future, heat is involved. In every sequence of events that becomes absurd if projected backwards, there is something that is heating up. If I watch a film that shows a ball rolling, I cannot tell if a film is being projected correctly or in reverse. But if the ball stops, I know that it is being run properly. Run backwards, it would show an implausible event, a ball starting to move by itself. The balls slowing down and coming to rest are due to friction. And friction produces heat. Only where there is heat is there a distinction between past and future. Thoughts, for instance, unfold from the past to the future, not vice versa. And in fact, thinking produces heat in our heads. Clausius introduces a quantity that measures this irreversible progress of heat in only one direction. And, since he was a cultivated German, he gives it a name taken from ancient Greek, entropy. I prefer to take the names of important scientific quantities from ancient languages so that they may be the same in all the living languages. I therefore propose to call entropy the quantity, S, of a body from the Greek word for transformation. Clausius's entropy, indicated by the letter S, is a measurable and calculable quantity that increases or remains the same, but never decreases in an isolated process. In order to indicate that it never decreases, we write, delta S is always greater than or equal to zero. And we call this the second principle of thermodynamics, the first being the conservation of energy. Its nub is the fact that heat passes only from hot bodies to cold, never the other way round. Forgive me for the equation. It's the only one in the book. It is the equation for time's arrow, and I could hardly refrain from including it in my book about time. It's the only equation of fundamental physics that knows any difference between past and future, the only one that speaks of the flowing of time. Behind this unusual equation, an entire world lies hidden. 
revealing it, will fall to an unfortunate and engaging Austrian, the grandson of a watchmaker, a tragic and romantic figure, Ludwig Boltzmann. Blur it is Boltzmann who begins to see what lies behind the equation delta s is always greater than or equal to zero, throwing us into one of our most dizzying dives towards understanding the intimate grammar of our world. Boltzmann works in Graz, Heidelberg, Berlin, Vienna, and then in Graz again. He liked to attribute his restlessness to the fact that he was born during Mardi Gras, he was only partly joking, since the instability of his character was real enough, oscillating as it did between elation and depression. He was short and stout, with dark, curly hair and the beard of a Taliban. His girlfriend called him my dear sweet chubby one. It was he, this Ludwig, who was the luckless hero of time's directionality. Sadi Carnot thought that heat was a substance, a fluid. He was wrong. Heat is the microscopic agitation of molecules. Hot tea is tea in which the molecules are very agitated. Cold tea is tea in which the molecules are only a little agitated. In an ice cube, warming up and melting molecules become increasingly agitated and lose their strict connections. At the end of the 19th century, there were many who still did not believe in the existence of molecules and atoms. Ludwig was convinced of their reality and entered the fray on behalf of his belief. His diatribes against those who doubted the reality of atoms became legendary. Our generation were at heart all on his side, remarked one of the young lions of quantum mechanics years later. In one of these fiery polemics, at a conference in Vienna, a noted physicist maintained against him that scientific materialism was dead because the laws of matter are not subject to the directionality of time. Physicists are not immune from talking nonsense. Looking at the sun going down, the eyes of Copernicus had seen the world turning. Looking at a glass of still water, the eyes of Boltzmann saw atoms and molecules frenziedly moving. We see water in a glass like the astronauts saw the Earth from the moon. Calm, gleaming blue, from the moon they could see nothing of the exuberant agitation of life on earth, its plants and animals, desires and despairs, only a veined blue ball. Within the reflections in a glass of water, there is an analogous tumultuous life made up of the activities of a myriad of molecules, many more than there are living beings on earth. This tumult stirs up everything. If one section of the molecules is still, it becomes stirred up by the frenzy of neighbouring ones that set them in motion too. The agitation spreads, the molecules bump into and shove each other. In this way, cold things are heated in contact with hot ones. Their molecules become jostled by hot ones and pushed into ferment. That is, they heat up. Thermal agitation is like a continual shuffling of a pack of cards. If the cards are in order, the shuffling disorders them. In this way, heat passes from hot to cold, and not vice versa, by shuffling, by the natural disordering of everything. The growth of entropy is nothing other than the ubiquitous and familiar natural increase of disorder. This is what Boltzmann understood. The difference between past and future does not lie in the elementary laws of motion. It does not reside in the deep grammar of nature. It is the natural disordering that leads to gradually less particular, less special situations. It was a brilliant intuition, and a correct one. But does it clarify the difference between past and future? It does not. It just shifts the question. The question now becomes, why in one of the two directions of time, the one we call past, were things more ordered? Why was the great pack of cards of the universe in order in the past? Why in the past was entropy lower? If we observe a phenomenon that begins in a state of lower entropy, it is clear why entropy increases, because in the process of reshuffling, everything becomes disordered. But why did the phenomena that we observe around us in the cosmos begin in a state of lower entropy in the first place? Here we get to the key point. 
If the first 26 cards in a pack are all red and the next 26 are all black, we say that the configuration of the cards is particular, that it is ordered. This order is lost when the pack is shuffled. The initial ordered configuration is a configuration of low entropy. But notice that it is particular if we look at the colour of the cards, red or black. It is particular because I am looking at the colour. Another configuration will be particular if the first 26 cards consist of only hearts and spades, or if they are all odd numbers, or the 26 most creased cards in the pack, or exactly the same 26 of three days ago, or if they share any other characteristic. If we think about it carefully, every configuration is particular. Every configuration is singular. If we look at all of its details, since every configuration always has something about it that characterizes it in a unique way, just as for its mother, every child is particular and unique. It follows that the notion of certain configurations being more particular than others, 26 red cards followed by 26 black, for example, makes sense only if I limit myself to noticing only certain aspects of the cards, in this case the colours. If I distinguish between all the cards, the configurations are all equivalent. None of them is more or less particular than others. The notion of particularity is born only at the moment we begin to see the universe in a blurred and approximate way. Boltzmann has shown that entropy exists because we describe the world in a blurred fashion. He has demonstrated that entropy is precisely the quantity that counts how many are the different configurations that our blurred vision does not distinguish between. Heat, entropy and the lower entropy of the past are notions that belong to an approximate statistical description of nature. The difference between past and future is deeply linked to this blurring. So if I could take into account all of the details of the exact microscopic state of the world, would the characteristic aspects of the flowing of time disappear? Yes. If I observe the microscopic state of things, then the difference between past and future vanishes. The future of the world, for instance, is determined by its present state, though neither more nor less than is the past. We often say that causes precede effects, and yet, in the elementary grammar of things, there is no distinction between cause and effect. Footnote. There are a few more details given on this point in chapter 11. End of footnote. There are regularities represented by what we call physical laws that link events of different times but they are symmetric between future and past. In the microscopic description, there can be no sense in which the past is different from the future. Footnote. The point is not that what happens to a cold teaspoon in a cup of hot tea depends on whether I have a blurred vision of it or not. What happens to the spoon and to its molecules as well obviously does not depend on how I view it. It just happens regardless. The point is that the description in terms of heat, temperature and the passage of heat from tea to spoon is a blurred vision of what happens and that it is only in this blurred vision that a startling difference between past and future appears. End of footnote. This is the disconcerting conclusion that emerges from Boltzmann's work. The difference between past and the future refers only to our own blurred vision of the world. It's a conclusion that leaves us flabbergasted. Is it really possible that a perception so vivid, basic, existential, my perception of the passage of time, depends on the fact that I cannot apprehend the world in all of its minute detail? On a kind of distortion that's produced by myopia? Is it true that if I could see exactly and take into consideration the actual dance of millions of molecules, then the future would be just like the past? Is it possible that I have as much knowledge of the past, or ignorance of it, as I do of the future? Even allowing for the fact that our perceptions of the world are frequently wrong, 
Can the world really be so profoundly different from our perception of it as this? All this undermines the very basis of our usual way of understanding time. It provokes incredulity, just as much as the discovery of the movement of the earth did, but just as with the movement of the earth, the evidence is overwhelming. All the phenomena that characterize the flowing of time are reduced to a particular state in the world's past, the particularity of which may be attributed to the blurring of our perspective. Later on, I will delve into the mystery of this blurring to see how it is tied to the strange initial improbability of the universe. For now, I will end with the mind-boggling fact that entropy, as Boltzmann fully understood, is nothing other than the number of microscopic states that our blurred vision of the world fails to distinguish. The equation which states precisely this is carved on Boltzmann's tomb in Vienna, above a marble bust which portrays him as an austere and surly figure, such as I don't believe he ever was in life. Many young students of physics go to visit his tomb and linger there to ponder, and sometimes the odd elderly professor of physics as well. Time has lost another of its crucial components, the intrinsic difference between past and future. Boltzmann understood that there is nothing intrinsic about the flowing of time, that it is only the blurred reflection of a mysterious improbability of the universe at a point in the past. The source of Rilke's eternal current is nothing other than this. Appointed a university professor at just 25 years old, received at court by the emperor at the apex of his success, severely criticised by the majority of the academic world which did not understand his ideas, always precariously balanced between enthusiasm and depression, the dear, sweet, chubby one, Ludwig Boltzmann, will end his life by hanging himself. He does so at Duino, near Trieste, while his wife and daughter are swimming in the Adriatic. The same Duino, where just a few years later, Rilke will write his elegy. <laughs>